and welcome to the very first Women in International Law Distinguished Voices interview series hosted jointly by the American Society of International Law's Women in International Law Interest Group and the Harvard International Law Journal. My name is Kathy Zhang. I am a second year law student here at Harvard Law School and I serve as an executive submissions editor on the Harvard International Law Journal. I have the honor today of introducing Judge Rosemary Barquette, the winner of the Prominent Woman in International Law Award in 2017 and a judge on the Iran US Claims Tribunal since 2013. Before her appointment to the tribunal, Judge Barquette was on Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Um, and then before that, uh, you were the Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court and the court's first woman justice. Uh, more recently, in 2015, Judge Barquette was appointed to the panel of conciliators for the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. In 2016, she was elected honorary president of the American Society of International Law. We are so incredibly lucky to have her here today to answer some questions about her background and career, her advice to aspiring international lawyers, and her opinions on the future of international law. So uh, please join me in welcoming Judge Marquette. Thank you so much for joining us today. If it's all right, uh, let's start by talking a little bit about your background. Okay. Uh, you want me to tell you a little bit about it? My parents yeah. were both born in Syria uh, in 1899 and in 1905, respectively. And uh, they married very young and tried to come to the United States directly with my father's brothers who, uh, but my mother was pregnant. And so they were unable to come together with my father's brothers because they were caught by the, uh, by the limitations of the immigration laws at the time, which limited the number of immigrants that could come from particular countries. So they couldn't come and they, the, after my brother was born, they thought, well, if they, if they managed to come through Mexico, then they could come and join their family in, uh, in Florida. So somehow or another, which is an amazing story in itself, I mean, it amuses me that we think that the stories of people today are so remarkable when the stories of these immigrants back in those days is so amazing to me. Somehow uh, at the age of maybe 19 or 20 for my father and maybe 16 or 17 for my mother, uh, they managed with a child to get from homes or place near home, Syria, to Marseille and get on a boat and get to Mexico. And when they got to Mexico, they found that they were barred by the same immigration laws. And so they were unable to come to the United States right away. So they spent 20 years in Mexico, and um, which is where I was born, where my siblings were born. So my first language was actually Spanish, uh, although my elder brothers and sisters spoke both Arabic and Spanish. Mm. And um, we ended up coming to this country when I was about six, and I went to Catholic schools here and uh, obtained my education thereafter in Miami. Wow. Um, how do you think being an immigrant and, and a child of immigrants has shaped your view about America and, and its promise that's inscribed on uh, the Statue of Liberty? Well, it, it shaped the view that I had a few years ago. I'm not so sure it shapes my view of it today, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> But when I was growing up, my mother, my mother loved this country. I mean, she was a totally, uh, yeah. a, a, a total fan of the, of America. She spoke with an accent. And uh, I think I, I, I derived a great appreciation and love for it from her derivatively. But throughout my legal career, the more I saw about the constitutional principles, the, the uh, attempt mm -hmm. to obtain equality throughout the years, even though the, 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 um, when we fell by the wayside, somehow or another, the country would pick itself up and, and recover and try to do better. I think all of that uh, was entirely impressive to me from a whole different perspective, from a legal perspective. I consider it like amazing that I had both 
the Syrian experience and the Mexican experience and the American experience. And I think the, 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 the more experiences that you are exposed to, the more understanding that you have of the various viewpoints and perspectives that different people have. So I, I, I was very fortunate in that regard um, in terms of, you know, in terms of my job description as it were, because part of what I think a judge has to be is to understand the positions that are being presented. And you do that much better when you have as wide a perspective as you, as you can obtain. And then as a human being, I, I just can't minimize the tremendous opportunity and, and the tremendous joy that having all of those experiences in music and in food and in people and in just expanding your joy of living uh, gives you. Um, so I, 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 I want everyone to have that experience. Now, obviously they can't all be born of immigrant parents, but they can go places and they can relate to people and they can talk to people and learn languages and experience foods and musics and be open to all of that. And I think it makes you a better person. Similarities between people's desires and their needs and their wants and their concerns are uh, also uh, seem to me to be a touchstone of gaining more understanding of how to make the world a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so law school classes in recent decades, but especially in recent years, have become increasingly diverse in this way and in, in this multicultural fluency. How do you think, or do you think this is going to shape the practice of law going forward? I hope so. I mean, I, I think, I think <laughs> diversity is extremely important because we are a diverse race. I mean, we, uh, we have to represent the views and understand the views of varying groups of people and perspectives. And so, of course, I think it's terribly important. You cannot understand if you don't open your mind in some fashion to understand. And clearly, you, you don't you can't always have the same experiences, but you can learn about them. I mean, you can read about them, you can talk to people about them, you can travel, you can try to understand why someone has a different perspective and what in them develop that perspective. So yes, I think it's hugely important. So do you think that this drive to learn more about other people's experiences and to hear them and really understand them informed your choice of career to be a lawyer, a judge? Um, it sounds like you could easily have gone into investigative reporting or psychiatry. Or It's very limiting to have only one life because yeah. there's so many things you would love to, to be doing. But I cannot say that I am disappointed in having chosen the law. I love the law. I love being, I loved being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I, I loved being, I love being a judge. Um, and I think it, it, it I, I'm not sure how I can answer the question of whether or not it, the, my experiences as, as an immigrant or my childhood experiences informed that, uh, that decision. Uh, it ended up being a great fit for me in my in my own judgment. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I love. I, I don't I don't consider myself a brilliant person by any means. I mean, I'm smart enough, but I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm not the philosopher that I would love to be, along with all kinds, you know, a great musician, a great actress, a great everything. But I, I love the, the concept of an organized society where people uh, can interact peacefully with one another. And that's facilitated by the rule of law. And so that's, yeah, okay. It definitely is, except that, people don't define the rule of law the same. And that's a big, huge problem. Everybody, I have been at conferences all over the world, sponsored by all kinds of regimes. Mm -hmm. And everybody is touting and uh, the, the rule of law. Mm -hmm. But 
the rule of law as it as it as it is expressed in a country with a dictator is very different than the rule of law um, you know in in a democracy or in a republic and so I think a lot more work has to be done about trying to get people on the same page um, trying to get people on the same page about what are the essentials that the world thinks of as part of what the rule of law would be. And, and that, that is not easy because there are cultural issues that conflict with the rule of law, very frankly. You, you mentioned that you really liked being a lawyer. Uh, what was the transition from lawyer to judiciary like and why, why did you decide to make that transition? Um, I practiced law in a small trial law firm and like many small trial law firms, I mean, uh, it was only about eight or 10 people. Um, things went along very well. And then of course, disagreements arise and then people decide to go their own ways. So I decided to practice on my own for a year and then it became a very hard, um, a hard situation to maintain because as a single practitioner, you need somebody to, and, and as a trial lawyer, you need somebody to cover your hearings. You're constantly uh, on the run. And, and so I reached a point where I knew I would either have to go to work for a firm or join somebody or do something. And at that point in time, the members of the judicial nominating commission came to me and said, you know, we would like, we, we want, I, I, I was in a very small, uh, I was practicing in West Palm Beach, which was a small legal community. So everybody in the trial community knew everybody and the people on the committee wanted a, a trial lawyer uh, on the bench. And we didn't, you know, as opposed to some um, transactional lawyer who may not be as familiar with, which is there's nothing wrong with transactional lawyers. It's just that trial lawyers would like somebody that understands the, the problems no. <laughs> yeah, <it's trial. laughs> that's right well and and you know how difficult it is sometimes to make a hearing or to need a continuance or and so forth so they they approached me and said I should apply which is something that I, had never occurred to me I did I never thought I could be a judge I, I didn't I didn't know anybody I wasn't politically uh, uh, aware uh, probably as much as I should have been. But at any rate, um, so I applied and I, I thought this was a perfect time. I could take a year or two to become a judge and see the law from that perspective. And then I would become such a great trial lawyer after that. And so I applied, I got appointed. And after that, I didn't want to leave the bench at all. I loved it. And um, it was, uh, it was a terrific and has been a terrific experience. Yeah, so after the Florida Supreme Court, you went on to be a judge at the 11th Circuit and then most recently at the uh, Iran US Claims Tribunal. What are the biggest differences that you found between these state and federal institutions and then the U US and international institutions? Well, the, the the differences between the state court and the federal courts is not so great. Uh, the process is pretty much the same. You consider evidence, you study the law, you try to apply the law to the facts of a particular case. And you, the process of the, the appellate process is the same. The lawyers come, they argue, you debate in conference and you write opinions and explain your reasons for, um, believing that one side is more correct than the other. So it's procedurally, it's not so different. Mm -hmm. Substantively, it's very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the jurisdiction that, of course, the 11th Circuit covers all the federal jurisdiction, much of which was not something that you would deal with uh, on, the, on the state uh, appellate courts or trial courts. So that was one thing. And the way they looked at rules differed a little bit. I was very surprised. For, for example, in Florida, we have, uh, or had, I haven't, hopefully we still have it, a rule that says, uh, a, a concept that says that in a criminal case, 
if all of these, if you only have circumstantial evidence and that circumstantial evidence is equally consistent with guilt or innocence, you cannot convict because how can it be beyond a reasonable doubt? Yeah. Well, when I got to the 11th Circuit, the law in the 11th Circuit was that the jury just decided it was still an open question. And I was very you know, surprised at that. Uh, uh, I still think that doesn't make much sense, but uh, things like that. And then, of course, the more obvious things like all of the federal uh, laws, um, bankruptcy, uh, e everything else that it, it doesn't have anything to do with state law. So the substantive law is very different in both. But And you're also a little bit closer to the to the people, to the lawyers, to the litigants in state court, you're much more aware of the ramifications of what your decisions are, it has seemed to me. The federal court seemed a little bit more aloof. And US institutions and international institutions, I imagine there's a bigger cultural difference between those two. Huge. Yeah. I mean, it's a whole different thing. Um, and, I, you know, I feel a little, a little guilty talking as though I, I am an expert on the differences between international law and the U.S. law because my, you know, it, I am not someone who has spent 30 years in the international law arena. Uh, I, I've spent 30 years or 40 years in the U.S. legal system and I feel extremely comfortable talking about that and the differences. I I have been involved in international law academically or from an interest perspective for many, many years before I got on the court. In fact, uh, I was very involved with ASIL um, for many years trying to help um, uh, to participate in having part of the uh, programs, the educational programs for judges encompass international law because again i've always felt that the more judges knew the better judging uh would occur and um that's how i got to know charlie brower and people like uh giants in the field of international law and so i was always interested but i was never i never thought that I, there would be a career for me in in international law until i was asked in 2013 to consider the uh, Iran United States Claims Tribunal. So my experience was was more intellectual before that and then my experience thereafter has not been huge. Of course there is the tribunal, but the tribunal is a very different animal than many of the um, experiences an international lawyer would have because it is not a one-shot deal. You're not sitting for one arbitration, you finish it and you go on to something else. This institution has been there for, four, for almost 40 years. Mm. And um, it's a quasi arbitration, quasi court. Mm. Uh, and it sort of has its own rules and it's been going on for 40 years. And the precedent that has been established has been established by different people throughout 40 years as judges have come and, and gone. And so, uh, n number one, it's a different institution. Number two, the, cons the way international law is practiced on the continent is different from principles that I, I was familiar with. Um, I, I think um, there is a lot of waste of time in international arbitrations of almost every kind. But, but again, you have to take everything I say with a grain of salt because it's not like I have experienced 200 or 2,000 arbitrations. But I have participated in several um, uh, non-tribunal arbitrations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've observed many, and then I've seen uh, my own tribunal. And it does seem to me that there is a lot that could be considered about the U.S. system in terms of, for example, motions to dismiss. It seems to me there are a lot of, you know, in the United States, you cannot file a complaint without being careful that you believe that there is a litigious issue that is legitimate. 
the rules require that a lawyer examine their complaint and be able to assure themselves that it's being filed in good faith. I'm not, there is nothing comparable that I'm aware of, is there, on the international See, there, there's no control either. The arbitrators do not have the same control that a federal or a state judge has over frivolous complaints that are filed, for example, or imposing sanctions for ethical violations. There doesn't seem to be much of that. So you have to operate in a different theater in order to try to achieve justice, which, which does hap happen, I'm sure, a lot. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's a more circuitous route than it seems to me that some of our rules have, uh, have made easier in, in a common law system like ours.